Welcome everyone to uh, today's McLean Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Ben Herbstman. I'm a psychiatrist uh, and psychoanalyst uh, affiliated with McLean um, and the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. And um, you have joined us today for the 20th annual Adam Cornell Major Teachers in Psychotherapy Lecture. First, I want to recognize and thank the Corneals for making today's lecture possible. Fred, a former member of McLean's Board of Trustees, and his wife, Marty, created this annual lecture in honor of their son, Adam. Katie, Adam's sister, and her mom have been regular guests at this lecture for many years up until Marty's death in 2017. And I also want to thank McLean psychiatrist and Bitsy psychoanalyst Len Glass, who graciously and skillfully stewarded this lecture for its first 16 years. The Corneal's goal in making this gift to McLean was to help promote psychoanalytic thinking at McLean and psychotherapy at Bipsy and to enhance the relationship between these two institutions. This year, we are very excited to welcome Dr. Jonathan Shedler as our 2021 Adam Corneal Major Teacher of Psychotherapy speaker. It's both fitting and fortunate that Dr. Shedler is the Corneal speaker on this special 20th anniversary occasion, given his decades educating clinicians about the importance and value of psychotherapy. Dr. Shedler is an internationally well-known author, researcher, and clinical educator. He is well-known for his widely read psychoanalytic paper, The Efficacy of Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy, which firmly established psychoanalytic therapy as an evidence-based treatment. He is the co-creator of the Shedler Weston Assessment Procedure, or SWAP, a clinician-completed psychological test for personality assessment and a clinical case formulation, and he is co-author with Nancy McWilliams, a previous Cornell major teacher of psychotherapy speaker, speaker of the personality syndrome section of the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual, or PDM-2. Dr. Shedler is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco, and a faculty member at the San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis. Given Dr. Shedler's expertise in examining the research behind different kinds of psychotherapy, we are very fortunate to hear his thoughts today in a lecture entitled, Truth in Advertising, Examining the Evidence for Evidence-Based Therapy. Dr. Shedler. Hello, everyone. I can't see you, but I assume you're there somewhere in the, uh, in the internet abyss. I'm delighted to be here with you today, and let's just jump right in. Our topic today is... Our topic today is evidence-based therapy. And just so we're all on the same page, um, you know, the, the, the term evidence-based is a little, um, <laughs> it, it sounds like something really good. And, and, and some people kind of stop there and don't look behind the term and say, what do we really mean? What are we really talking about? Um, evidence-based therapy, as the term is used, um, has a several characteristics. One is that it refers to therapies that are very brief, typically eight to 12 to 16 sessions at the most. The only exception to that is some longer term therapies for personality disorders. But generally when people say evidence-based therapy, they mean uh, very brief time limited therapies. Um, it, the term also means that the therapies are manualized. They're conducted by following, uh, by following a, a treatment manual. They are geared or targeted toward a specific DSM diagnosis, major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, panic attack, uh, panic disorder, and so on. Um, and not exclusively, but usually when people say evidence-based therapy, they mean manual, brief manualized CBT. Um, I culled some words and terms that appear over and over again, both in the research literature and in, in the popular press, the popular media, um, about how these therapies are described to clinicians and to the public at large. Uh, so the word is evidence-based. Sometimes they're called empirically validated. They're typically referred to as the gold standard of treatment, proven effective, proven effectiveness, proven benefits, powerful treatments. Um, and just, you know, to put some substance around those, those words, um, you know, I, I, I pulled a few quotations from the literature. This isn't, this isn't anything unusual or special. I mean, this is the kind of, this is the kind of comment one 
finds typically in, in articles on, on evidence-based therapy. So this is from uh, Stephen Holland, who is a leading, a leading CBT researcher. He says the empirically supported, that, that was the term before evidence-based, the empirically supported psychotherapies are still not widely practiced. As a consequence, many patients do not have access to adequate treatment. So, you know, what he's essentially saying is if it's not one of the therapies that meets, you know, that meets these criteria, um, it's, it's not adequate. People shouldn't get that kind of therapy. Um, other people have gone way farther. And this is Walter Michel from Columbia University. The disconnect between what clinicians do, meaning clinicians who are not practicing these brief manualized therapies, and what science has discovered is an unconscionable embarrassment. And, and I'm putting those quotations up, not because I mean, not because they're they're unusual in any way. I'm putting them up because they're 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 typical. This is this is this is the information that that clinicians and researchers are exchanging with one another. Um, there have been quite a few articles in the popular press addressing this topic, and I, I'm not putting the slides up so that you should read the whole slide. Um, I, I just want you to get the gist of it. Ignoring the evidence, why do psychologists reject science? And again, it's, it's hitting the same theme, that if you're not practicing, if you're not delivering these approved evidence-based manualized therapies, uh, you're somehow rejecting science. Uh, do, do therapists know what they're doing? Don't bank on it. <laughs> the, uh, don't bank on it, three psychologists say. Here's another one in the Washington Post. Is your therapist a little behind the times? And as you might imagine, uh, the article goes on to say, yes, your therapist, if, unless they're delivering an evidence-based treatment, which is to say manualized CBT, um, uh, your therapist is not up with the times. And actually the article goes on to compare um, other forms of therapy to pre-scientific medicine. And I'm gonna quote from the article, pre-scientific medicine when healers commonly used ineffective and often injurious practices, such as blistering, purging, and bleeding, right? So, you know, the message out there is actually very clear. And the message is evidence-based therapies, meaning manual ICBT, are proven effective. Other therapies are inadequate, passe, outdated. Um, oh, even former president of the American Psychological Association, Alan Kasdan, you know, jumped on that bandwagon. Is individual therapy overrated and outdated? In many ways, yes, it is, says Alan Kasdan. And he laments that it's difficult to find therapists or refer to therapists who are practicing manualized evidence-based therapy. So you'd think the scientific evidence must be really strong. And that's what I believed. I'm an evidence-based guy. I've been a researcher my entire professional career. I believe data, I collect data, I promote data, right? Um, but the thing is, I, I wanna kind of include you on my journey to this because I didn't wake up one day with everything I'm gonna tell you today, uh, you know, just, <laughs> and I just wake up one day and, and there it all was. Um, I was an attending in an outpatient psychiatry department. And over the course of several years, I staffed cases or met patients, literally thousands of patients. I mean, you know, somewhere between five and 10,000 patients. And what I saw day in and day out was really an endless procession of patients coming through our clinic who had had these evidence-based therapies, who had completed the therapies and were suffering every bit as much as, as before they started. And that was, that was the dilemma. And I thought that was my dilemma. And I thought, I believe the science, I believe the research, but I also have to believe the evidence of my own eyes and ears. Either I'm getting a bizarrely, you know, uh, you know, unrepresentative sample in the, in the psychiatry clinic where I was teaching and attending, or there's something going on here that we need to understand. Now, um, Around this time, a few years ago, the American Psychological Association came out with the most comprehensive review of, um, of 
evidence, they came out with several reviews. Uh, this one is for depression. They came out with clinical practice guidelines for the treatment of depression based on the most comprehensive review of the research that had ever been, uh, ever been undertaken. And uh, it actually is 600 no fewer than 675 pages, of which 537 pages are complex tables and forms of just, just densely complex information and, and st statistical information about, about research methodology and statistical data analysis. Um, Nobody in their right mind reads it, 500, 675 pages of it. Um, I guess I was feeling either, you know, very curious or very masochistic. I actually did read it. And um, there's just two things about it that you need to know. One is that the guidelines, um, you know, unambiguously and strongly recommend that clinicians should be practicing evidence-based therapies, meaning brief, you know, manualized with instruction manuals, um, not exclusively CBT, but all of the therapies they recommended were brief, manualized, and 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 not open-ended therapy, but therapy targeted to one specific DSM diagnosis, in this case, depression. Um, and the report actually goes on to say, you know, all clinicians should use this, suggests that clinicians who don't use these therapies are, are unethical, emphasizes again and again and again that these therapies are of proven effectiveness. And then buried in the fine print on page 90 of the article, of the guidelines document rather, I came across this sentence, which I'll read to you. It's highlighted in the document. Four decades of psychotherapy research have shown, four decades, that after treatment completion, more than half of the patients remain depressed. And of those who do improve by the end of treatment, about 40% of those experience a relapse. You know, typically in, in very brief follow-up intervals, typically six months, sometimes a year. Right? So I do a little arithmetic, which you can do also. And the arithmetic is, let's take that sentence at face value. If we have 10 patients you know, who have depressive, major, who have major, bleh, <laughs> who have major depressive disorder diagnoses, um, who all get evidence-based treatment for depression, at least five of them don't improve at all. Right, forty percent of those who do improve relapse quickly. So that's two more. Um, so five. Where'd we go? Five plus two is seven out of ten patients who get these treatments either don't improve at all or relapse pretty quickly, which made things make a lot more sense to me. And. You know, this this really bothered me because I I, mean, I, I, I am a proponent of, of science and data, but it made me wonder if I misunderstood something like that so in such a big way, what else had I misunderstood? And I want to share some things that with you that I found that I when I looked into it. The other set of guidelines that the American Psychological Association had just issued was guidelines for the treatment of PTSD. This was 675 pages of densely complex statistics. But um, here's what APA said, spokespeople for a a APA said about the recommendations. Of course, the treatments recommended were exclusively very brief like eight to 10 sessions of, of manualized, you know, manualized time-limited therapy. And the spokespeople promoting these practice guidelines said, for providers, I'm, I'm quoting from, a, from an APA publication, the guidelines offer recommendations that quickly summarize which treatments have been shown to work for hundreds or even thousands of patients. So if you haven't read the original primary sources research, if you're a practicing clinician or um, 
or a patient or a family member of a patient, you know, the message is very clear. The treatments work, right? It, it, it could not be less, you know, it could not be less ambiguous. The message is the treatments work. And they go on to say, if there was any doubt about it, for families, the guidelines provide clear information on the best treatments and what to expect of them. So there's really no question about the, the position that the, um, you know, that the people who assembled the guidelines are taking. So I did a little fact checking. There's quite a lot of papers uh, that they summarized in, in this, the meta-analysis that led to the guidelines document. Um, I'm gonna share with you one of the best known studies uh, that's included in the guidelines, not just the best known, but probably the best study because of the sample size and the rigor and you know, how it was done. It was, published, it was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, pretty prominent publication. It's about cognitive behavioral therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I, I'm using this study as an example you know, not because the results are atypical. I'm using it as an example because the results are absolutely typical of, of what the studies found in this, you know, in these, in these practice guidelines, um, and because it's arguably the best study out there. And here's what it says in the JAMA article. So first of all, among the patients who were assigned to the CBT condition, it was prolonged exposure therapy more specifically, which is a, a form of CBT. 40% um, of the patients never even finished the trial. They dropped out typically after the first or second session, you know, which sort of makes you wonder, were the patients voting with their feet? But let's leave them aside. What about the rest, the ones who stayed there? Of the ones who stayed and completed the treatment, 60% of them, almost two thirds, still had PTSD after they got done with the treatment. All of the patients, who were enrolled in the study were clinically depressed at the time when they were enrolled, and all of them, 100%, were still clinically depressed when they finished the treatment. 19 of the patients enrolled in the study experienced serious adverse ev events, which were uh, suicide attempts and emergency hospitalizations, typically due to suicidality. And you really had to read the paper pretty carefully because they emphasized the findings, um, the, the outcomes that were from the data that were collected on the day that the study ended. But they also collected, to their credit, um, follow-up data six months after treatment. And six months after treatment, it turns out that the CBT condition actually did not perform and an inert therapy control group that actually didn't even attempt to, uh, to treat, didn't even attempt to treat uh, PTSD. And, uh, you know, so I, I looked in the discussion section of the paper, what did the researchers say about their own findings? And they said pretty clearly, well, patients may need more treatment than the relatively small number of sessions typically provided in a clinical trial. And again, more treatment or additional types of treatment may be needed. In other words, the researchers were saying about their own study that, you know, for a great many of the patients in our study, this treatment isn't enough treatment or it isn't the right treatment. Patients need something more. And um, just to sort of hammer home the point that these findings aren't, aren't um, atypical, uh, there was a paper published afterward in also in JAMA that did a meta-analysis of all of the available research on, um, on evidence-based treatments for PTSD. And it did something a little different. Instead of reporting statistical significance, I mean, they actually went to the trouble to calculate remission rates. And what they found across all of the available studies is that overall two out of three patients who receive these, these treatments that are, that are described as evidence-based treatments, two out of three of them still have T PTSD after they're done being treated. And this was my state of mind when I got done reading this literature, which made me really, really curious and made me decide that it was, it was time to take a really deep dive into the research evidence supporting the treatments that are called evidence-based treatments. And that's what 
that's what this talk is about. Um, it's in three parts. And sorry, it's in three parts. The first part is um, I'm going to take a, a deep dive with you guys into what the research really shows, because there's a bit of a discrepancy between what the primary sources are saying and you know, kind of the word on the street about proven you know, gold standards, evidence based, proven effectiveness, and so on. Part two, after we, you know, after we establish what the research is really is really saying about outcomes, I want to take a closer look with you all at uh, research practices in this area of research. You know, some of it's kind of eye opening, and part three, toward you know the goal of the talk, which is truth and advertising. I, I want to share with you some ideas about antidotes, about how we could make things better and and, and do better science. So. Let's start with part one. What does research really show? Um, I thought it was important to go back to the very beginning of the evidence-based therapy movement. Um, so at, at the heart of evidence-based therapy is the idea that psychotherapy should be studied the way we do medication trials. There should be a treatment group, a control group, ideally a placebo control group, a placebo of, of some sort, um, and really, you know, really using the same research logic and statistical methods that we apply in medication trials. And the first really, really big study that did that, really the mother of all evidence-based therapy research, was the famous NIMH Treatment of Depression Collaborative Research Program. And the program involved, it, the study was initiated in 1977. Um, the first article of major findings came out in 89. So um, it took you know, more than 10 years to, <laughs> it was a multi-site, just, just enormous study. And um, what the study, it had three arms and it compared CBT, IPT or interpersonal therapy and antidepressant medication. Um, and and the, the word on the street is all, so first of all, the findings were all three of those treatments proved to be comparable. Um, they were all more effective than a placebo arm. In the placebo arm, patients received a placebo medication and check-ins with the doctor, but not therapy, not treatment. They got a they got a sugar pill and 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 nothing else. Word on the street: every one of these therapies is evidence based and superior to placebo. I'm going to focus primarily on CBT because it gets the most attention these days. So, proven effectiveness. The primary outcome measure in this study was the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, which as many of you probably know, is a 54 point scale, you know, commonly, commonly used in research on depression. So what was the difference on the Hamilton Rating Scale, right? Going back to the actual primary source and the actual original data in its original form, what was the difference between the CBT arm and the placebo control arm on the Hamilton Depression Scale? 54 point scale, it turns out that the difference between these two groups was 1.2 points on the Hamilton depression rating scale. I want to take a look at what 1.2 points means. Here's a copy of the Hamilton depression rating scale. I'm just going to zoom in on its uh, you know, 21 items. Each one gets a score, but you know, let's just zoom in on one of the items. I want you to see what 1.2 points like means. So here's a question, hypochondriasis. And it's already a two point difference on the scale, depending on whether the, the person, typically a research assistant um, who's doing the interview and the ratings, uh, decides that on a particular day, um, the, it's more true that the person is, uh, has bodily self-absorption -absorb or more true that the patient has a querulous attitude. That accounts for two points right there. <laughs> In other words, you know, it, it's just two points is, is, is a meaningless, I mean, 1.2 points is a meaningless difference. Wait. They had a secondary depression scale outcome measure, they used the Beck depression inventory. And on that measure, the difference between the treatment and the control group was less than one point. And, you know, I mean, the bottom line, and this is just not, just not debatable, is 1.2 points, less than one point. I mean, these, these differences between treatment and control group 
don't don't even pass the so what test. So I got really, really curious because I, for 25 years, I'd been going to talks at medical conferences and people would refer to the study. And, and it was just, you know, it was just automatic. I mean, if they referred to the study, they would say CBT, antidepressant medication, IPT are empirically validated treatments for depression. So I went back again to the primary sources to see how did the original researchers describe their data? This is the publication. First major, major publication of results. Um, the important information was right up in the abstract and I highlighted it. So let's zoom in on it. There was limited evidence for the specific effectiveness of interpersonal psychotherapy, IPT, and no evidence for cognitive behavior therapy. Um, some years later in 1994, Irene Elkin, um, who was the lead author of that, wrote a, a sort of comprehensive chapter called the NIMH Treatment of Depression Collaborative Research Program, where we began and where we are. And what she wrote, and this is, you know, obviously worded in very careful, you know, careful scientific academic language, but it's pretty clear what she's saying. What is most striking in the follow-up findings is the relatively small percentage of people who remain in treatment, recover, and remain well through the 18-month follow-up period. In fact, the percentage was so small that it raises questions about whether the potency of the short-term treatments for depression have been, quote, oversold, quote, in the original. So what percentage of people got well and stayed well through the follow-up period? Um, turns out it's 24% of the patients got well, which is another way of saying, you know, about 75% did not get well, right? It's exactly the finding that I started with that's in the, um, that's in the American Psychological Association practice guidelines, right? Seven out of 10 patients um, either don't improve or relapse quickly. Right? There's the finding. It comes up again and again. So, you know, I'm left scratching my head, like, how can this be? We've been told that the opposite for the last 25 years, we've been told that manualized CBT is powerful and effective. It's my request to you all. I'm, I'm just the messenger. I'm citing primary sources. This is not my interpretation or my spin. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from the original primary source findings. Um, so in the course of scratching my head, I, I came to a few, um, a few realizations. Uh, I'm actually embarrassed to say that the first time I presented these data from the NIMH study, um, I misunderstood. I thought that 1.2 point difference between the treatment and the control group must be statistically significant. And that's why people are reporting it as you know, findings you know, supporting the efficacy of manualized CBT. And um, I, I, it turns out I was wrong. Actually, the 1.2 point difference between the two conditions was not significant. But, but the point I want to make stands. Um, take this away. Take this home with you. Remember this. This is really a, a central point of this talk. Um, the word statistically significant doesn't mean what you think it means. Doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means. Um, so the issue is that the word has two meanings. And in the English language, the dictionary definition is that if we say something is significant, we mean that it's, it's important, it's of consequence, it's, you know, it's meaningful. Um, but the thing is in, in statistics, um, all the word means is that the difference between a treatment and the control group probably could not have been accounted for by chance. It doesn't say that there was a big enough difference to make a difference or that it's a scientifically meaningful finding or that patients got well. And just as we can reject the null hypothesis that the data could have produced these results by, you know, purely by coincidence, right? Which is not the same as saying it helps patients. And, and I wanna call your attention to something and, um, which is when researchers have a finding that matters, they don't talk about statistical significance. They talk about the finding. So, you know, for example, um, if you had a treatment, you know, intended to help 
overweight people lose weight. You wouldn't say people who got this treatment you know, experienced statistically significant benefits. You just wouldn't say that. What you would say is the average participant in our study lost 35 pounds or whatever. You would tell people the finding. You know, if you had a um, if you had a drug to reduce blood pressure and it had a meaningful benefit, you wouldn't say the benefit was statistically significant. What you would say is, you know, the average patient enrolled in this study, you know, had a 15 point drop in millimeters of, of mercury. Um, or if you had a, you know, the point is, if you have a finding, you tell people the finding. You don't focus on statistical significance. So one of the take home messages I'd like to leave you with is if you read a study and the emphasis is on statistical significance rather than the actual amount of change in, in, in intrinsically meaningful, in an intrinsically meaningful metric, you should be very, very suspicious. And you should go back to the primary source and start asking some, some tough questions. All right, so the NIMH collaborative research study, I and mean, that was a long time ago, that was 25 years ago. That was then, what about now? So the most recent really big you know, study that's even comparable to that um, was published a few years ago in 2013 in uh, the American Journal of Psychiatry, big, you know, multi-site major collaboration. Um, it compared manualized CBT, brief 16 session CBT with brief manualized 16 sessions of psychodynamic psychotherapy. And um, they didn't find any meaningful differences between the two treatment conditions, but <laughs> here we go. This is from the discussion section of the patient. One notable finding was that only 23% of the patients achieved remission. Sounds familiar. It's exactly the same finding that the NIMH collaborative study found 25 years before, right? Except, you know, now it's the sort of modern updated CBT and modern updated psychodynamic therapy. But the finding hasn't changed. So our findings indicate that a substantial proportion of patients require more than time-limited treatment to achieve remission. Again, the same finding. Like if, you, if you didn't know better, you'd think you were, you know, maybe they plagiarized the results from the NIMH depression study. All right, there it is. Same finding. So I've kind of given you a sandwich. The earliest major study the most recent major study of manualized evidence-based treatment for depression. Um, what about everything in the middle? <laughs> Maybe it's possible that the, that the start point and the end point just you know had bad outcomes, and, and uh, you know, and, and that's not typical. Um, all of this research was reviewed, and and what's turned out to be a kind of an infamous 2004 paper um, by my, uh, my colleague, Drew Weston, and, and several of his associates. Um, they did a comprehensive review on all of the available published, you know, published RCTs for depression, anxiety, and panic disorder. And um, I mean, it's a it's a wonderful paper, well worth reading, very com complex, but I'll, I'll you know, summarize the important points here. Um, first of all, the findings that they got with respect to depression are exactly what I just described from those major studies. Most patients didn't get well. And the same was true for generalized anxiety and, and for panic. And just some, you know, some highlights, the average patient who got evidence-based therapy for depression remained clinically depressed after completing treatment with an average Beck depression inventory score uh, greater than 10. The average patient treated for panic disorder, and panic, by the way, was the condition for which brief manualized therapies were, was, were most effective. This was the best of the best in terms of you know, what diagnosis, you know, what diagnosis seems to be amenable to this kind of treatment. But the average patient treated for panic disorder still had panic attacks almost weekly and still endorsed four out of seven of the DSM symptom, DSM-4 symptoms for panic disorder. The other thing they found is they looked at follow-up data and it turns out that the best the patients ever looked was on the day the treatment ended and that the benefits began evaporating immediately so that 
by six to 12 months out, the majority of the patients were actually looking for treatment again for the very same condition. Majority, more than half of the patients were looking for treatment for the same condition. That doesn't mean that the half that weren't looking for treatment got better. <laughs> some of them got better, and some of them likely decided therapy doesn't work. It doesn't help me. They never came back. So what does the research really show about the therapies we've, we've all been calling, including me, evidence-based therapy? Well, you know, what it really shows is that for the most common condition, common conditions that we see, like major depression and generalized anxiety disorder, um, relatively few patients get well and stay well. Uh, the, the benefits for most of the patients are relatively small. And even the relatively small benefits seem to be, for, for many patients, um, seem to be temporary. And what I learned, and I, I, I'm trying to distinguish between you know, the actual findings and the primary sources versus my personal interpretations or conclusions. So I wanna make a distinction. This slide, I'm, I'm now telling you my personal conclusion from this, is that the word evidence-based is actually not being used the way people think it's being used. Um, so evidence-based therapies have, these properties, uh, this isn't opinion, this is, this is fact, but I'll, I'll tell you what my personal opinion and conclusion is. The properties are to be considered an evidence-based therapy, the study has to be studied with an RCT design, randomized control trial, like a med medical, you know, uh, like a medication trial. The interventions have to be manualized, right? If it's not manualized, it doesn't count as evidence-based therapy. It has to be targeted to a specific DSM diagnosis, whether or not patients come packaged with one single, D, you know, one single DSM di diagnosis, and that's all they're looking for for therapy. Typically, there's fidelity checks in the better studies, meaning, um, you know, meaning they record the sessions and make sure that the that the clinicians are actually following the manualized interventions. And, uh, you know, the, the sort of general rule of thumb is you need to find statistically significant benefits compared to control group in at least 10, in at least two RCTs. But notice that none of these criteria have anything to do with the benefits to patients. These are criteria that have to do with issues about research methodology and numbers of studies completed. Right? So my conclusion is that people are using the term evidence-based to refer to research methodology rather than what people think it means, which is to refer to you know, the outcomes that patients experience. Part three, or part two, sorry. Let's take a closer look at some research practices because once I got on this roll and started taking a deep dive, it was like going down a rabbit hole. And I kept finding things that, you know, something made me look for something else and that something else made me look for something else. I'm going to summarize the things that I found that, that to me were most concerning. Um, four points. Most patients who have the disorder are not counted in the studies this is a problem. The second problem is that control groups are routinely misused. The third problem is, although the therapies are promoted as having you know, proven superiority or shown, shown, shown superior to other treatments, it turns out that that's a bit of an alternative fact, to use a commonly popular term. And it turns out that data are being suppressed. And I'm going to go to primary sources. Um, so first of all, Let's walk through these points. Um, the typical trial for um, an evidence-based therapy is excluding two thirds of the patients who get referred into the trial. So in other words, the patients are coming in, they have the diagnosis, right? they're referred into the study for treatment and two out of three of them get thrown out a priori before the study even begins typically because of comorbidities or, or you know or or risk factors but um so 
before we even start, we're, we're down to one third of the patients that have the disorder that, that we're studying. Um, so let's do a little arithmetic. Two thirds of the patients are excluded up front. Among the remaining one third, about half of the patients who are enrolled in the study and are treated improve. Well, that's about 16% of those originally referred into the study. Fewer than half, you know, improving is one thing, getting well as in losing your diagnosis is, is another thing. Fewer than half get well. And of those, fewer stay well during the follow-up period. So I call it the mysteriously vanishing treatment benefit. Here's all the patients who are referred into the study. Here are the patients who meet the inclusion criteria, the patients who improve, the patients who get well, the patients who stay well. And when we're all done, we're down to about 5% of the patients who are originally referred into the study. So what I ended up thinking is, you know, here's all the patients, the iceberg is all the patients out there who have the diagnosis, the ones that were seeing who are reported in research findings are, you know, about this much of the iceberg. Getting a theme on this, <laughs> on these little pocket slides here. Uh, control groups are misused. What do I mean by that? Well, here's a study. Uh, an IMH funded study purports to compare CBT with psychodynamic therapy. The finding that was published and promoted and publicized is CBT was superior to psychodynamic therapy. In decre this is a study for single incident PTSD, by the way. So we started with patients who are all healthy to begin with. Right? No one had any prior psychiatric history. They had a single specific identifiable traumatic event and developed develop PTSD as a result. Then they were ran randomly assigned to receive CBT or psychodynamic therapy. And the researchers said CBT was superior to psychodynamic therapy. So let's look at the fine print. Was it a level fat playing field? So it turns out the CBT therapists were trained for five days by the developer of this form of this form of CBT, world famous Edna Foa, five days. The psychodynamic therapists were actually not trained and licensed therapists. They were grad students. They were trained for two days by another grad student in a lab devoted to studying and researching and promoting CBT. And if you're already thinking that doesn't sound like a level playing field weight as it gets better, the so-called psychodynamic therapists who were grad students with two days of training were not permitted to discuss the trauma with the patients who came to treatment for trauma. They had their hands tied behind their back. And um, you know, in the real world, if somebody claimed to be offering treatment for PTSD and they would change, this was actually in the manualized instructions. The therapist changed the topic when the subjects tried to, when the patients tried to bring up the trauma. Um, I mean, in the real world, it would be considered malpractice. In the research world, that's considered a control group. It's like, really? Yeah, you know, really? You, you just can't make things like this up. So, um, it turns out, you know, you might be asking, it, so, so the authors claimed to have shown superiority to psychodynamic therapy, but that's actually not the control group they used. And you say, well, Shedler's a kind of cagey guy and we know he's pro psychodynamic therapy. Maybe he cherry picked a study that, you know, that, that had a really questionable control group. They can't all be like that. <laughs> so um, a research team led by Bruce Wampold in 2011 actually examined exactly, exactly this question in clinical, so prestigious clinical psychology review. Um, they explored the question of control groups in depth for depression and anxiety. And um, basically what they found was that the patients in the control group either were not getting treatment, period, no treatment, 
or they were getting a sort of inert, you know, sham treatment where all of the active ingredients had been removed by the researchers. And that was the typical way of doing the research. And as the control group more closely approximated any form of bona fide, you know, legitimate therapy at all, any brand, all right, that right, was actually intended to help the patients not be an in, intent to fail condition, any superiority between the researchers, you know, favorite evidence-based th treatment and the controlled treatment went away. So I just want to, you know, quote from the article is I'm, I'm all about primary sources today that um, the treatment as usual control group is so common in the research that it's usually just uh, abbreviated with an acronym TAU and the researchers refer to TAU and, and it's never described further. But when you read the descriptions, it turns out TAU is predominantly treatments did, that did not include any psychotherapy whatsoever. That was the majority of studies in the literature or they were therapies like in the study that I just mentioned for PTSD, where the therapists were prevented from providing the treatments they normally provide. And they concluded in you know, academic language, there is insufficient evidence to suggest that transporting an evidence-based therapy to routine care that already involves psychotherapy will improve the quality of services, which is a sort of academic way of saying these therapies were not better than what people are already doing in the community. What about data being suppressed? Um, there's uh, a, a meta-analysis, uh, one of the major researchers in the field um, doing meta-analyses on depression is, is Pim Kuyper, as I've learned is how you pronounce his name, from the ne Netherlands. He's published a, a ton of meta-analyses, just honest, you know, straight shooter, reports it as he finds it. And um, he looked at studies for CBT for depression and he found that the effect sizes were inflated by 60 to 75% due to publication bias. So what does this mean? Um, um, there's something in the literature and, and it's not just about therapy or depression. I mean, it's across the board, but, but publication bias is that if you have a study that gets the results you want, it's more likely to get published. And if you get a study that doesn't find the results that you want, it's likely to end up in a file drawer and never be heard from again. And it's actually in, you know, in, in scientific literature, it's actually called the, the file drawer effect. And the question is, how do you know what's in people's file drawers that you've never seen? How, how would you know something like that? How, how could you find that out? And it turns out there's a, a pretty straightforward way to do it. And I'll, I'll just, give you a, a, a sort of a quick overview of how that works. Um, suppose I did a survey of Americans and the survey question is, um, are you for or against building a border wall with Mexico? And I had very small samples of say five people. In a sample of like five people, because it's such a small sample, it's just the luck of the draw, you might get a sample where it looks like 100% are in favor of it. You might get a sample that looks like 100% are against it. Right? So when you have small sample sizes, you get a big scatter of results, right? a big range. As the sample size increases, Right, the values, the outcomes converge on, you know, uh, tend to converge on similar values, and you get something that we think probably approximates the truth in the population. And right, so if you were to, if you were to graph studies showing, you know, effect sizes in in you know uh, treatments with evidence-based therapies. Um, effect sizes on the bottom and the sample size on the top, you get something called a funnel plot and it looks like this. And if there's no publication bias, the funnel plot looks pretty much like the one I just showed you. If there is publication bias, you get something like this, where all the data points that are supposed to be here aren't, aren't in your sample. And that's what the researchers were finding. That's why they were able to say effect sizes were inflated by 75% because all the data points that should have filled out the rest of the distribution weren't there. Um, 
I have more, but but uh, I want I want to leave some time for discussion. So so let me just jump to the conclusions, and I'm I'm going to skip over recommendations about what we can do differently. Maybe it'll come up in the discussion section. Um, I, I want to go back to what evidence based is supposed to mean, right? So the the term comes from the term comes from medicine. It became popular, I mean, really got on the map in the mid 90s. And what evidence-based was supposed to mean and what's described in the you know, original sources is, I mean, basically it was a call for critical thinking. It was saying, you know, we've always done it this way is really not a good enough justification for using a, you know, any kind of intervention or diagnostic procedure, um, the, our, our decision should be based on three things. One is they should reflect our clinical knowledge and expertise. They should reflect what our patients want, our patients' values and preferences, and they should be based on relevant scientific evidence where it exists. And the intersection of these three, these three things is the definition of evidence-based medicine. And I'm actually a major supporter of that. I think these are very, very reasonable things. And we, this is a minimal standard we should hold ourselves to. But, but look what's happened to these concepts as it applies to the study of evidence-based psychotherapy. So the first is the relevant scientific evidence doesn't really seem to count because we disregard our own findings. We have studies that show that 75% of people who get a treatment, you know, don't get better, and we still go out in public and say the treatment works and it has proven effectiveness. And we also ignore evidence, equally compelling or more compelling evidence for other forms of therapy that are done differently, that are not done by following an instruction manual, that are exploratory rather than prescriptive. The second is like patients aren't actually being given a choice. If the patient is told, this is the gold standard of care, this is evidence-based and proven, I mean, I mean, the patient isn't in a position to make an informed decision. The patient's not going to say, well, wait a minute, what is the effect size? And what control group did you use? And how many of those people like remitted and how many of them stayed remitted? I, I mean, all of this falls apart if the patient isn't actually informed. And then finally, because these are manualized therapies for a specific DSM disorder, in, in some very important ways, we're not allowing the clinicians to fully be the clinicians they were trained to be, right? I mean, experienced clinicians don't start with, this is treatment for this or that DSM diagnosis. They start with, let me understand my patient. Let me understand what's causing their suffering. Let me make a case formulation about the psychological factors underlying their suffering. I talked about this last night. Um, and let me structure the treatment accordingly as I see fit Right? rather than session one, you do this, session two, you do that, and it's pre-specified by an instruction manual. So um, I think we've taken the, the term evidence-based therapy and turned it into something else. So final point, why should you believe Jonathan Shedler? Everything I'm saying is probably different from everything you hear from everywhere else. <laughs> Don't believe me. <laughs> I really, really encourage you to go to your primary sources. When somebody makes a claim for the benefit of a treatment, ask to see the primary source. Read the primary source, especially the fine print, and draw your own conclusions. But your own conclusions are, here's what I would suggest you ask when you read the primary sources. Three really, really basic questions. What's the researcher's definition of recovered or better or improved? Find out what they mean and whether that accords with what you think recovered or improved means. Once you've found out what the researcher means by recovered, what percentage of the patients recovered? That's it. What percentage of the patients recovered? And what was the comparable percentage of patients in the control group? And what I wanna to suggest to you is, if you can't find the answers to those questions in the research paper, something is pretty wrong. And um, I'll stop here and leave us at least a few minutes for questions. So thank you.
So, uh, Jonathan, uh, that was a, just such a thought-provoking talk. You would have been hearing a lot of applause. Probably no gunshots, but I can't promise. Maybe <laughs> it's good we're in Zoom. Um, so we probably it's twelve fifty three. I know we have a hard step at one, and there's some been great a couple a few a lot of great questions. But it, I want to just highlight one because I think your your answer would be kind of interesting. So one person said, you know, they appreciated the talk, um, but are you just sort of being skeptical or, or what are you constructively suggesting? And another person that I think is sort of a related question said, as a long-term clinician, I've resisted manualized treatments and I felt them interfere with what I think is the most important, which is the development of a relationship. So I thought that might be a, a good question before we wrap up to, to send your way and see what your thoughts are. Um, it's an excellent question and it anticipates what I was going to say next, but I, I didn't plan the time very well. And I'm sorry for that. Um, here's a limitation of these studies. It is not an empirical finding, right? It's not evidence-based that we can treat longstanding disorders, you know, say depression in eight or 12 sessions. That is not an empirical finding. That's an a priori assumption that the researchers made. They decided part of the research protocol, this is going to be the length of treatment, right? There's actually a tremendous amount of research on how long it takes for therapy to start to have meaningful benefits, right? So, so more naturalistic research, right? Where, where we, we track progress over the course of therapy and look at just, just how many sessions does it take before something meaningful starts to shift? And um, I, I wrote a paper on this. You can, you can look it up. It's on the web. It's called the tyranny of time. Just Google Shedler and tyranny. It'll pop right up. Um, but it's a review of that research. And it, and it turns out that meaningful change starts around the six month mark and continues right on average in big samples to 12 to 18 months out. So a meaningful therapy duration, you know, we, we ought to be studying therapies of, of at least six months through 18 months and all of these studies, right? So, so therapy is just starting at six months. All of these studies on evidence-based therapy are declaring the treatment is over when all of the data from the naturalistic studies tell us that therapy is really just, just getting started. So that's one concrete recommendation, study therapies of realistic duration. Second concrete recommendation, because I want this to be de constructive, not destructive, is report, stop focusing on statistical significance, report results in an intrinsically meaningful metric. What percentage of patients were admitted, meaning they don't meet the criteria for the disorder. Or if you're studying depression, what's the actual score on, if you're using the Hamilton depression rating scale, how many points change did you see, right? Don't destroy the metric, right? Preserve, preserve an intrinsically meaningful metric and report that. And the third is stop focusing on outcomes the day treatment ends because that's not really what's important to patients or clinicians. You should have at least minimum six month follow-up period. And that should be your major focus. Right? Did, did the patients get well and stay well for at least a, a, a little while? So those are three like concrete, I hope constructive suggestions about how we might do research differently that would be in the spirit of truth and advertising. Well, with, with that, um, just a, a deep, felt a uh, heartfelt thank you for um, providing such a wonderful lecture um, and for it being so thought provoking. Um, so, and thanks for everyone for, for joining us today. Sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions, um, but we appreciate you joining. So thank, thank you, you Dr. All. Pleasure to be here.